Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. We're recording the show here on the afternoon of Friday, the 22nd of July, 2016. It is the morning after the Republican uh national convention, Republican anti-national convention, I should say, after the closure of that. And of course, the diatribe of the the silver-tongued orator of uh, middle queens that would be uh, Trump, the fascist demagogue, fascist billionaire. Trump has had his day, right? The cat will mew and the dog will have its day. Well, there's a dog having his day, and that is Trump. So we have all kinds of interesting things about that we're going to have to sort of rush through starting now. First of all, we have the true running mate of Trump, right? You've seen there was an attempt to launch the candidacy of the hapless and bungling Indiana Governor Michael Pence, who obviously works undercover. In other words, he's a deception operation. He uses the aw shucks Middle West uh, persona in order to mask horrendous, horrendous crimes. The guy is the leading bigot, one of the leading austerity ghouls. He is, of course, a warmonger, unreconstructed. And you notice a holy roller... But he doesn't believe in anything. He's happy to yoke himself to the team of horses. He hopes to be the wheel horse. That's his ambition in life, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to support Trump and bring about a Trump regime. So we had the attempt to launch Pence on Saturday, completely botched. Trump steps on his own event, can't control himself. This character is the most immediate. And um, and then, of course, the other night, the day before, well, when was it? Wednesday night. It was supposed to be Pence's night, but the uh, a different Holy Roller beat him to the punch. Obviously, Cruz has a more direct line to God than Pence uh, ever did. So Cruz was able to dominate the evening's proceedings by splitting the Republican Party once again uh, against Trump. And you're going to hear, I'll give you a quick rundown of the stuff we covered all during the week. Right? We're very happy with our uh, Tax Wall Street Party live tweeting. You can see that on my Twitter feed. I'll, you can see most of it anyway. Um, uh, Tarpley.net and then uh, Webster G. Tarpley Twitter feed and also in the briefings of the Tax Wall Street Party. Uh, I'll, most of those tweets are included so poor Pence got his uh, debut stomped on, but now we have the real running mate. It's David Duke. David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist. He talks about European Americans. Well, we don't want your damn European American demagogy. This person is a, um, a gutter snipe. This is white trash. David Duke. This is what we... Uh, we don't want in the U.S. Senate. But now we have the ticket, right? On the Trump ticket, we have Pence, I guess, but the main, the main person who's going to overshadow Pence is David Duke, who uh, expressed, he, apparently he was inspired by the wonderful ranting of Trump to come out of his shadows, to come out of, from under his rock with these creepy, crawly centipedes and millipedes. Out came David Duke, and um, he's now going to spread his filth there in Louisiana for the European Americans. Boy, is that an odious, an odious idea, right? The whole point of being American is you're not hyphenated, not any way, not any kind. So uh, this is a, a more extreme version of the identity politics uh, that you see in other political formations. But let's um, also go into the atmosphere, first of all. Right? We've covered a lot of the details, and we'll do as many as we can. Um, the notion here, of course, is pessimism. 
defeatism, the essence of Trump, defeatism, the futility of action. Uh, he is certainly a Hobbesian thinker. He imagines the world and human society in particular as the war of all against all, the bellum omnium contra omnes. He is a social Darwinist, right? He believes in brutal, unnatural selection to be carried out under conditions of cutthroat competition and deception. Look at the people who gravitate to him, people like this Roger Stone, who uh, indeed is an inveterate, compulsive liar. We have all this. Um, Trump really unencourageable, right? obviously a, a psychotic who at his age cannot change, will not change, doesn't want to change, and has said so. I'm not changing. Well, um, that means dead from the neck up, Don. So um, it's pessimism. The darkling plain. And we are on a darkling plain filled with confused alarms where ignorant armies clash by night. It was the world of the film noir. <laughs> it was, everybody says it was dark. Yeah, dark. It's dark as in dark ages. Trump is the harbinger of a new dark age and the destruction of everything positive in American history. It's a dance macabre of horrendous distortions and crimes. It's a world of no compassion. It's a, it's a post-industrial apocalyptic moonscape. And notice what was missing. There was Lucifer, of course, brought in by Ben Carson. Ben Carson is mentally disturbed. He was mentally disturbed all during the campaign. That's what people could see, but they were so polite. And they, they were so politically correct, they didn't want to say that Ben Carson was crazy. So we have Lucifer that Hillary Clinton wrote about uh, this uh, character in Chicago, right? The uh, rules for radicals uh, character. It, and remember, this is, a, this is a graduate thesis, right? This is, uh, uh, you know, Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky was a counterinsurgency operative who hated Roosevelt and hated the unions. And his idea was indeed to mobilize poor neighborhoods, including black, to bust unions. That was his whole uh, reason for being. So clear, Hillary Clinton does uh, support some of that. <clears throat> but it's that the dedication is to Lucifer, who is the biggest uh, rebel. This is somewhat far afield, wouldn't you say? Somewhat recherché, someone somewhat weit hergeholt, right? Doesn't make any sense. So there's Lucifer, but there is no God, right? It's clear. Trump is a pagan. And he's, you know, he's in Christianity, he says he's a Methodist, but he's never had to ask for forgiveness. Well, that's, that's paganism. Uh, there is no compassion. There is no mercy. Woe to the vanquished. And, of course, one other remarkable thing. A couple of years after this, Occupy Wall Street. How many mentions of Wall Street were there at all in this idiotic Republican National Convention? I didn't listen to, all, to a lot of it. I heard it once as sort of en passant, right? It was just a um, mentioned as a you know, catalog of other problems, right? Other things that the poor American people, my God, these whiners, these, these crybabies uh, have to suffer from. Back in a minute. Back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Top here in Washington, D.C. The hangover from Trump's demagogic tirade, right? His Philippic against civilization is still, uh, he it hangs heavy over the land, uh, but not here. So uh, he never mentioned Wall Street. He never mentioned Wall Street. I would say the stuff that Trump has to say about NATO is an attempt 
to maintain some radical cover without talking about Wall Street, because he never talks about Wall Street. He doesn't talk about the Federal Reserve. He has no plans to, uh, to do anything vis-a-vis -vis Wall Street, uh, the Fed, uh, the big banks, n none of this stuff. Too big to fail, too big to jail. No, no, no. He, he, he says he wants law and order. How about the antitrust laws, Don? How about the securities fraud laws, Don? Uh, too big to fail, too big to jail. How about some of those? Uh, are we going to have law and order, or is this only directed against the desperate, uh, excluded, uh, underprivileged uh, people in society? It's a very selective uh, application. Selective and vindictive, it would probably be called in some courts. So no Wall Street. There's nothing about a protective tariff. All this song and dance about protectionism and trade, free trade, I think, is the enemy. You, you want to develop the world division of labor as much as you possibly can, but you need protectionist elements. We here at the Tax Wall Street Party call for a 15% protective tariff. And that puts us in a class by ourselves, practically, because Trump obviously does not do that, nor does, does Hillary. So we are the gold standard by which these other fakers ought to be uh, judged. Um, it is a Gnostic apocalypse. And by that, I mean the founder of Gnosticism, right, the sort of parody of, uh, of existing religions that uses them for completely uh, abusive purposes. Uh, Simon Magus, when Simon Magus was in Rome, right, fighting under the under the reign of Nero and fighting St. Peter and St. Paul, getting getting them both killed. Uh, it was uh, Simon Magus who essentially formulated the three-step version of, uh, of Gnosticism, which is simply this. The world is coming to an end. Right? That's the whole darkling plain and, and dark ages of Trump. But I can save you. Make checks payable to Simon Magus then or to Donald Trump now or give me your votes, give me give me your obeisance, I bow down and worship me. It is once again radically anti-historical. Uh, he says, for example, uh, concerning America first, right? When you say America first, it means essentially a pro-Nazi lobby, pro-Nazi as much as you could be in the United States at that time, which said, don't get involved in saving the, the British and then the Soviets, but let them go down and we retreat into Fortress America, and then uh, Hitler will be coming for you within, you know, five years, ten years, whatever it is, or some other, you know, some successor of Hitler. Uh, that was exactly the Nazi line, was America first. <laughs> ignore the British, ignore the Soviets. Let them you know, sacrifice them eagerly. Trump then says, when asked about this, I don't mean it that way. I only mean it in the now sense, only in the current sense. Well, there it is. The curse of American thinking in general, radically anti-historical. Um, I've got some, I've written some stuff about this in the 9-11 uh, synthetic terror book. I'll see if I can find that and uh, and quote it for you. But you'll see the idea is that we have this wonderful quote from Leibniz where he talks about the immediate uh, outlook, the immediate uh, frame of mind, the immediate way of thinking. And he calls this um, mens momentania, a completely momentary mind with no sense of the past, carens recordationem, lacking memory, lacking historical context. So there it is. Um, and of course, he complements his demagogic performance with the Republican platform, which, although I haven't looked through it and completely, it's um, socially reactionary. In other words, on all the so-called social questions, hot button social issues, completely reactionary. And don't say that there was no overt racism. There was plenty 
Uh, and of course, it was you know dog whistles. It was all uh, you know veiled commentaries. The bluntest was the Bull Connor of the 21st century. That Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, down there on the border. His line is that all all undocumented immigrants, illegal aliens, are thieves and criminals. And this is absolutely monstrous. Uh, the, the, the Trump campaign's idea of outreach to the middle class, I suppose, is the uh, – what can we say? The, the uh, anarcho-capitalist right, who wants to set up uh, areas where there will be no – no child labor laws, no uh, no minimum wage, no nothing. That's Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is the leader of the Young Wolves faction of the Bilderberger Group. So he was there and talked about his sexual preferences as if anybody cared about that. So that was an attempt by Trump to get a little bit of, what can we say, progressive cover. There's also this character, Barack, Barack, um, who has worked in the past for Baby Doc Duvalier, the not Papa Doc, of course, but then Baby Doc Duvalier, bloody voodoo dictatorship in Haiti, worked for them and worked for the Saudis. So I'm, I'm looking at that guy, Barack, as some kind, some kind of business associate of Manafort, and you've seen a lot of Manafort. I'm amazed Manafort has not been been fired. Right after you look at look at all this blundering and uh, failure, they couldn't manage the cruise issue. They couldn't somehow um, use a little bit of flexibility to allow certain votes. It's been raised on television that they that Manafort and company were afraid that if they allowed anything, any kind of expression to go on that uh, they would lose control <coughs> control of the uh, of the whole so i'm not going to go into the merits of what trump has to say about nato which i think is absurd i would just say once again trump is attacking nato to avoid attacking wall street this is a cheap parlor trick don't be fooled back in a minute on world crisis radio back to world crisis radio in Washington, D.C. So this was a red-faced, enraged, apoplectic speech. This was a diatribe by the id, the subconscious mind, right? The monsters from the id came out and strutted and fretted their hour on the stage and usually you'd expect a republican reactionary to be uh, more uh, what can we say a little bit sunnier a little bit more optimistic right to some deference to the american tradition of uh, optimism but uh, no not trump uh, because again he he's not so much up there carrying out a political strategy he is acting out the deep needs of his own sick sociopathic ego. He is a psychotic. And I think the most dramatic thing that has occurred this week is the coming forward of Tony Schwartz, who was of New York Magazine. He was approached by Trump in the, uh, what, the, the late 80s. Uh, 30 years ago, and was asked to be the ghostwriter, the writer, the sole writer of The Art of the Deal. And that guy, Tony Schwartz, has come forward now, ruining the day. He is a penitent, sackcloth and ashes, because he's saying, I have unleashed a Frankenstein's monster on the world. His biggest fear, if those stubby fingers ever get close to the nuclear button, or if he ever gets those launch codes, that is likely to be the end of civilization as we've known it. So I want to appeal to the petty bourgeois dummies and indeed the blue-collar dummies out there 
think very carefully, right? You know, Hitler had a plausible rap from a certain point of view, right? You had to be a little bit sick already. Mussolini had a plausible rap. So you're hearing a plausible rap, but now all of the historical examples show you that this leads to catastrophe, that this leads to the collapse of the country, that it leads to events that we we probably will now have to contemplate in some some detail, right? Nuclear exchanges, stuff like that. The stuff that the fail-safe systems were designed to prevent because you're dealing with a psychopath. Now, um, the other element, of course, in this convention was the fear and loathing of Hillary Clinton. That indeed is the only thing they agree on. They can't agree on any other program. That is why <clears throat> there was no economic program. Tuesday night was supposed to be putting America back to work, right? Keeping America safe, number one, Monday. Then th that was fear-mongering, right, to create the requisite atmosphere of fear and panic. But then the second one was fear and loathing. Uh, instead, on Tuesday, they went with fear and loathing rather than what they were supposed to do, which was to say, I'll tell you how to get the economy starting again, started again. There was nothing, no programmatic element, not on, on uh, trade and tariffs the way they look at it. There was nothing about uh, job creation. As I've said, there's nothing about re reigning in Wall Street, nothing about a protective tariff or anything of this sort. <clears throat> the only solution you get from Trump is, of course, the triumph of the will, right? Trust me, I'll take care of it. I'll do it, and I'll do it fast. Yeah, but how? Trust me, I'll do it, right? Where's the program? Like Mussolini said, too many programs already. My, the quality of my will and my, uh, my team, uh, I suppose, although with Trump, there's no team. Trump is actually worse than Hitler and Mussolini in the sense of the... Uh, the megalomania, because, you know, Hitler was surrounded by this court, right? You know, the various Himmler, Bormann, Hess, uh, Goering, Himmler. And in the case of Mussolini, these people are, are not quite so well known, but there was a jerarchia, right? There was a hierarchy of fascist bosses, right? Ettore Muti, Farinacci, different ones, um, De Bono. The triumviri, the three people who led the uh, the march on Rome, because Mussolini was afraid to be there. So uh, Trump is actually uh, worse. Now, um, the Nixonian elements are extremely strong because you've got Manafort, who is a, a you know regurgitated clone of Nixon. And Roger Stone, right, the scurrilous side, right, the Joker, he had to he had to resign because he had to have plausible deniability. He had to be at arm's length, so you couldn't blame Trump directly for his activities. Don't worry, we're blaming Trump anyway. Target is Trump, right? This Roger Stone is just a a cat's paw. He's part of the matador's cape. But um, law and order, they go back to Nixon, right? So law and order with Nixon. This was, of course, a dog whistle. Nixon used to say crime in the streets. That meant, you know, black street crime. Law and order, a lot of that meant uh, suppress anti-war demonstrations, suppress student protests about anything. Then it got to be strike-breaking, of course, and, uh, and then the rest. Uh, this is Nixonian. Uh, it is a call for a crackdown. It's a call for class war by people who have property against those who do not. And then, of course, I am your voice. No, you're not my voice. You cannot be my voice. Uh, that has to be <coughs> rejected. Now, Trump, of course, the main content of what he says continues to be this, um, you know, this stuff about um, how he, he not only will he impose law and order, but that he's the greatest, right? He's the biggest winner. He's the biggest winner of all time. Well, he's not. Um, if we look at the delegate vote, in other words, in the one public roll call vote that we saw at the convention, 
Trump won the nomination, right? He got over 50% plus one of the delegates. But in terms of the delegates, he had 721 Republican delegates voting against him. 721 is the worst result since Gerald Ford in 1976. Gerald Ford, of course, was not a, uh, an elected uh, president. He was an appointed president. He was never elected. He could never do it. So he was a weak candidate. And similarly, Trump got 721 people against him. They could never make it unanimous, right? Notice there was, there's often an attempt to make it by acclamation and unanimous. In this case, it could not be done, and they would have been happy to do it. So that's the worst delegate count. <laughs> and, and again, of course, who ran Gerald Ford's delegate operation? Manafort. Is that, is that a credential, Manafort, that you had just you had more negative votes than anybody since Gerald R. Ford. Let me just get back to the law and order part, right? The law and order question uh, has changed, right? Nixon could say <clears throat> in 1968 and 1972, he could say law and order means no black riots like in Watts or in Newark or in Detroit and so on down the line. Law and order appealed to this big white middle class majority who felt threatened. So uh, what you'd say is that that might have worked, and, and for Nixon it did work in the days of white majority and so forth. But now this is a much more diverse country ethnically. And you, if you look at black America and Latinos and others, they don't buy into law and order quite so readily because sometimes that's directed against them. So they're not going to respond to that the way Manafort and Roger Stone think. Turn back the clock is their real motto. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. World Crisis. This is Webster Tupper here in Washington, D.C. So turn back the clock. That seems to be it. I, these are nostalgics of some, I think, largely mythical uh, past utopia. When you actually, when you scratch down deeply, they all think of the 1950s. Um, but again, uh, there were obvious problems in the 1950s, right? Racial exclusion, stuff like this. But if you think about the positive side of the 1950s, what was that? That was simply the late New Deal. That was the New Deal after the war had ended and a lot of the programs were starting to function in the way that they were designed to do. Now, of course, you already had the 1957 recession, which was an extremely ominous sign concerning the future of the U.S. economy. You had imports, uh, sorry, exports declining. Trump never says anything about exports, but you get the idea. They're all kidding themselves. They're talking about the late New Deal, even as they uh, try to get themselves together to destroy what remains of the New Deal regulation. <clears throat> and so... Lock her up. There were calls by Trump activists out in the field for the uh, execution of Mrs. Clinton by firing squad. Another uh, element is, of course, the the uh, kind of uh, victimology, this lugubrious parade of victims, you know, unfortunate people who have been uh, badly hurt by aspects of modern society. The one that impressed me the most in a, in a rather bad way was this poor woman who her son had been one of the people who got killed in Benghazi, right? One of the four. Surprising, we never heard anything about the 4,000 plus who perished in Iraq and then a couple of thousand more who have perished in Afghanistan. But fine, so here's the woman and her loss is real. And she says, I hate Hillary Clinton. She killed my son. Wait a minute. How did she kill your son? And the answer to that from this poor woman, who is obviously mentally disturbed, there's no other way to put it, says, well, uh, Hillary Clinton personally told me that this had been caused by a documentary film or a propaganda film, and that was not true. Yeah, right. Uh, this, the son was already dead by the time Hillary Clinton made these remarks. Uh, and I challenge you 
find a Republican and say, look, do you do you if you had a uh, a murder case, would you be able to get an indictment from a grand jury, even degraded as these are, or start a trial in any way, if the claim was my son was dead and the Secretary of State came to me and lied about the causes, um, this cannot be entertained. This is simply out of this world. This is beyond the law of cause and effect. This is the reasoning of a mentally disturbed person. And the, the Republicans, even some of the liberal Republicans, would not ag admit that this was actually insanity being projected into the public uh, realm. Because it's, it cannot be murder. Whatever you say about somebody, if they're dead, uh, by the way, you can't even, you can't even, the dead, dead cannot sue for libel or anything like this, right? So they, they have fewer protections, not more. So uh, this was, uh, I think, a new low. And what, of course, it meant was that Trump and Manafort are scoundrels who use these grief-stricken, bereaved uh, families for their own cynical political uh, profit. Now, the big point, the tone and content of this Republican National Convention, with the the country besieged from the outside, betrayed by the allies, with a crime wave at home and a collapsing economy, and the need it's obvious dictatorship, right? It's a bid for an authoritarian dictatorship, at the very least, which would then evolve, I think, into a totalitarian dictatorship, right? More uh, Nazi measures would come in. Uh, this is what Trump is proposing, right? He, notice he doesn't say anything about constitution, separation of powers, checks and balances, limited government, none of that. Forget that. Political freedom? No, 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 no. <clears throat> not if you want to. Not if you want to criticize Trump. So it's a bid for a dictatorship, and it's a it's a desire to create this lugubrious, uh, darkling plane of terror and the state of siege, fear and loathing, and panic. All of these. Uh, it's an attempt to prepare the way for terrorist actions which Trump's speechwriters, handlers, controllers, and so forth, obviously see as imminent. And lo and behold, today we have a dozen people, I think, killed in a, <clears throat> in a uh, shopping center in uh, Munich, right? The Olympia Einkaufszentrum shopping center in uh, the, close to the uh, stadium, right? Which was the 1972 <clears throat> Munich Olympics. So you can call this a bet on terrorism. It's actually a fabank on terrorism. In other words, it's double or nothing on uh, terrorism. That Trump expects terrorism, and he's now positioned. It's clear that we are under siege, and Trump is the man on horseback. This couldn't be more obvious. So uh, Trump has essentially announced himself as the beneficiary of all future terrorism, because he'll blame it on Obama, Hillary and the rest of them. So that's a very uh, convenient position to be in. And you don't have to do anything except wait for the terrorism to happen and then get busy on Twitter with your uh, uh, you know, irrational uh, tirades and, and uh, disgusting explosions of uh, egomania and all the rest. So there it is. Terrorism. Trump equals terrorism. Trump thrives on terrorism. Trump means terrorism. Terrorism benefits Trump. He doesn't, he subjectively, he doesn't have to be involved in this, and I doubt that he is. Uh, I don't think he could keep his mouth shut. I don't think anybody would tell him anything meaningful. Matter of fact, there is a crisis already today. The secret intelligence briefings from Clapper and, uh, and Brennan and the rest of these people, uh, the intelligence crew, all discredited failures. Um, he's supposed to get these briefings, and I'm, I'm, pre I'm predicting already. Operation Blurtgate. Blurtgate. Blurtgate will mean he's going to be told some secrets, and he's going to blurt them out, and then he will lose the issue of whatever Hillary did or did not do to her secret documents and her secret email, 
Bloatgate will will show you that uh, that Trump is actually much worse because he's so dependent, he's so insecure, and so uh, uh, so much of a mythomaniac, so pathetically in need of attention, even if it's negative, that he's gonna he's gonna start doing that. So. Uh, he has also done some funny things. He, he doesn't say, I want to stop people coming from Muslim countries. He says, I want to block people coming from um, countries that are compromised by terrorism. He says he wants to fight the hateful foreign ideology. Doesn't quite make it Islam the way he has in the past. And um, he also, he, his language is that the, the wall is going to be built, but the U.S. is going to build the wall. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, these were the, uh, some of the issues. Now, let's look at what really <clears throat> happened on the several days. You'll remember that uh, in the previous week, the week before the convention, there had been meeting of the Rules Committee. And the Rules Committee of the Republican National Committee had uh, entertained a motion that would free up all the delegates to vote according to their conscience. They would no longer be coerced because there is no legal basis in federal law and therefore in state law. You can't force people to vote in a certain way, so-called imperative mandate. Can't be done. So <clears throat> this uh, issue was in the Rules Committee, and of course the Rules Committee said, no, you cannot vote your conscience. You're going to have to stay part of the lockstep, and we'll see how that played out in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So as the week unfolded, the previous week had seen these, uh, before the convention officially opened, before the plenum got going, the Rules Committee, where there was a motion to say everybody should be free to vote their conscience. Voted down. No way. Notice, though, <laughs> They had to stop the action for several hours using the threadbare excuse of a copy machine that did not work. This was the lie they told to stall because it actually seemed that they might not have the votes to crush this the way they wanted to. Some of the people associated with this process came forward proudly on Monday to say, we crushed those dissidents who wanted to vote their conscience. Uh, but the conscience clause was voted down. There was then an attempt to have a minority report in the Rules Committee. That was voted down. But there was still this question that the plenum meeting on Monday, convoked on Monday, right, gathering there in the hall in Cleveland, that they could still vote to say we reject the report <clears throat> of the Rules Committee. Now, the votes to do that were not there as far as we know. I don't know, maybe Manafort knew something else with the help of Roger Stone and these uh, thuggish personalities. Um, but on Monday, the attempt was to force a roll call vote of the states on the report of the Rules Committee. Uh, and to do this, you need, in the Republican Party, you needed need to get half of the delegates of seven states to sign a petition saying, yes, there should be a roll call vote. Nothing more than that, just a vote. Uh, the people uh, involved, right, the free the delegates and delegates unbound and delegates unchained, led by this um, woman, Kendall Unruh of Colorado, said that they had 11 states. Now, of course, as soon as you hand in the list of delegates, the arm twisting starts, the death threats, the threats to ruin people's careers and lives, right? The totalitarianism uh, that flourishes uh, here. It's not, you know, guys with uh, uniforms and truncheons, although there's something like that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's based on the sort of economic threat, right? You're going to lose your job. So... Um, the 11 states. Now, um, there was a whole series of back and forth things, right? There was all kinds of stalling. The uh, Free the Delegates people wanted to submit the uh, petitions, but the secretary of the convention went AWOL. She went and hid somewhere. They couldn't serve the papers. They needed a process server, but they didn't <clears throat> succeed in doing that. 
And then at a certain point uh, in the proceedings, they were going through the reports of the various committees, right? The report of the platform committee is a platform, the report of the credentials committee who is who is selected to take part and all this. And then the report of the rules committee. And then you had maneuvers like the chairman walking off the podium and coming back in 10 minutes uh, or simply stopping the procedure and playing some garbage music that they had uh, so that they could fix it behind the scene. Then they, then the Manafort uh, Priebus people come forward and say, hey, uh, some people have taken their names off these petitions, and here we have the forms, and that means you don't have one half of seven uh, delegates in, in these cases. So therefore, your petition falls short. Notice the Republican National Committee did not, and as far as I know, has not provided the written documentation of the original signers and then the written documentation who formally requested to be taken off the petition, signed, sealed, and delivered. They never give you that, right? So you just take their word for it. And of course, you can't, you can't do that. So at this point, there was a walkout. It was a walkout led by Colorado, right? Colorado, those delegates, the process had begun with a caucus, not so different from the Iowa caucus, right? This was the one that Trump and Manafort uh, objected to so much, right? This is where Trump said, oh, no, it's unfair. They're stealing delegates. Well, why didn't you go and compete in the in the caucus, right? Is, is, uh, is Iowa also not legit? There you got some delegates. And those you want, right, even though you didn't win. So uh, Colorado walked out. There were also some from Iowa that walked out. But Colorado, just about everybody walked out. That is a split. That's the split of the Republican Party. If anybody walks out, that's a split. And, of course, it's a, it's a split uh, until you see whether they're going to come back or not. And it looks like they did come back on Tuesday morning. But for those hours, after Colorado had walked out and before they came back, that was a split. That was a scission of the, uh, of the Republican Party. That's the kind of thing you had in 1860 or 1912 or 1948 in one of the other uh, parties. Okay? So uh, at that point, quite a few people leaving. One of them was former... United States Republican Senator Gordon Humphrey of New Hampshire. And he was asked, uh, what do you think just happened? I said, well, we've been shouted down. Uh, what, what would you say about the people who, who have done this to you? He said, they are brown shirts, brown shirts, Nazis, in effect. And they asked him, uh, what do you mean by brown shirts? And he says, people who act like fascists, fascists. He had also gone on record calling Trump a sick sociopath, a sick sociopath, says a former United States senator on the floor. And there were all kinds of other people. Take a look at my uh, verbal report, I think, on this. You had Mike Lee of Utah. You had Ken Cuccinelli of the... Um, Virginia delegation, those are two important swing states, by the way. Colorado and Virginia, those are swing states. Right? You might as well add in Iowa. Some of them left. Uh, and then uh, Congressman Buck, I think, of Colorado was also part of that. So there were people, they were named politicians, uh, current elected officials or big cheeses in their states who were part of this. Gordon Humphrey uh, set the tone. So... Uh, then there's this question with Ohio. This Ohio went through the entire week. And with Ohio, it was uh, the obvious fact, right? No Republican has ever been elected president without Ohio. How do you win Ohio? The main Republican machine, of course, is controlled by Governor Kasich. It is quite capable in the sense that it was able to elect, to give Kasich victory in the pri primary there, even though it was getting late in the day, and Trump had been winning, but Trump could not break the power of that Ohio machine. So if you're Trump, you want to ingratiate 
and uh, <clears throat> you know attempt to um, to win over the Ohio Democratic, uh, sorry, the Ohio Republican machine. And Trump would not do this. Instead, Roger Stone, acting now as a madman, went out and called Kasich. He said Kasich is a pathetic stoner who will never be president. So he went out and you know, just for no reason alienated and antagonized Governor Kasich. Manafort had done the same thing on Monday morning, saying that he's an embarrassment. He's an embarrassment to his state. Then in these that same evening, we have Copygate. We have Melania Trump, uh, who uh, she's she's obviously bribed uh, a lot of people in the in the press to uh, to fawn over her, but she shows up, I think, as a person motivated primarily by by vanity and uh, by you know the desire to cultivate a public image, and she had two purloined passages from Michelle Obama. 2008 in the heart of her speech. And we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Back to World Crisis Radio. So we concluded the events of Monday with the uh, plagiarized passage in Mrs. Trump's uh, speech, Melania. <clears throat> and of course, um, this became known quickly. It's actually suspicious, right? The, the theory is advanced by James Carville, who was a dirty trickster in his own right, uh, that Republicans had had done this to her as a dirty trick. In other words, anti-Trump Republicans allegedly planted those two paragraphs in the speech uh, and made sure that they did not get detected as a means of embarrassing Melania and Trump. And it sure did damage because it dominated Really, the most important theme from the media point of view of the entire convention was this. They didn't care about the denial of a roll call vote on Monday. They had some interest in the uh, feud of uh, uh, Trump and, uh, and his people with the Ohio uh, Republican Party, Governor Kasich and his advisor Weaver. But uh, obviously, Copygate, that was what got them going. So Carville says that anti-Trump Republicans – planted that in there, and, uh, you know, it's a certain credibility, right? The creep, the committee to reelect the president, is riding again, right? The dead hand of Nixon is around the throat of Trump, whether he knows it or not, through people like Manafort and Roger Stone. So this is the, the Donald Segretti school and the Roger Stone school. Now, who might have done this? How about a Bush family operative? Karl Rove. Because Karl Rove also goes back to the creep and Richard Nixon in 1972. So that's quite, quite possible. Now, just to liquidate this part of it, for 36 hours, Manafort and others lied. They say, no, there was no plagiarism. No, there was nothing. Then they finally came up with a uh, scapegoat, which is this woman, Meredith MacGyver, MacGyver um, a lowly – staff writer of the Trump organization. She was induced to come forward. She said she tried to resign. The wonderful Trump wouldn't hear of it. <clears throat> but she says she heard Melania read these things over the phone. She wrote them down, and um, somehow that got into the text. I don't believe this for a minute. This was this poor woman, uh, Meredith MacGyver, her sacrifice was to fall on her sword so that Manafort and his gang would not have to be fired and also that uh, that uh, Trump could go to Melania and say, look, uh, darling, I I made them pay. Right. I, I forced this woman to uh, to confess so that the onus is off of you. Now, on Tuesday, in terms of the split of the Republican Party, this could not have been more glaring, obvious, plastic stock. It's a split party. In the roll call of the states that elected Trump as the candidate, there were two vote counts. There was one vote count among the RNC bureaucrats loyal to Priebus on the podium. That was one vote count. And then there was the other vote count that if you wrote down what the states said, it was different. It was not enough difference, as far as I can see, to 
give the victory, well, to deny Trump victory on the first ballot. That would have been great. But uh, it did show that the Republican Party doesn't count your vote. They don't give a damn about your vote. All that stuff about Democratic representation, that's out the window. Because you'd hear the people, for example, from District of Columbia, all of the 19 votes in the District of Columbia had gone either to Cruz or to Kasich. And from the podium, they said, 19 votes for Trump. Utah, I think this was another example, right? the anti-Trump state, right? the uh, Mormon hierarchy is against Trump. Great. Uh, evil fights evil. So uh, th they, uh, same story, right? They had votes for Kasich, Cruz, others, all of those given to Trump. And then Alaska, and there were quite a few, right? Uh, there were any number of these uh, states. Actually, I ought to read you, if I can find it, I should read you the list here. Here are the, the rebellious states. Virginia, Iowa, Colorado, Minnesota, Utah, Washington State, Maine, Wyoming, District of Columbia, those are the ones that took part for sure in the attempt to force the roll call vote. Ohio is at war with Trump because of these personal feuds, and there are, there are others. You know, there were 11 on Monday before the arm twisting uh, began. So uh, we get two different vote counts. Alaska, they had some votes for Trump, but the way that it was counted was all for Trump. And this, and then Trump, of course, paid a price because at the end of the roll call vote that gave Trump the presidential nomination, Alaska stood up and said, we demand to be polled because you have not honestly counted our votes. So that took 10 or 15 minutes where everything ground to a halt and uh, people from the Republican National Committee uh, came out and they polled the delegates and they said, yes, but all rules say that you're not allowed to vote that way. We've decided. There were all over the floor of the convention the yellow caps, right? We've had the brown shirts, the black shirts, the silver shirts here in the U.S., domestic fascists. The yellow caps are agents of Priebus, right? Priebus and Trump, we guess who were essentially the political Gestapo on the floor. And they were there to intimidate, to threaten, to arm twist, uh, and what have you. So on Tuesday, the fight still went on. Uh, big, big fights between um, this guy Weaver. He said, oh, <laughs> Trump, your uh, VP rollout went so well. We're so glad that you've been able to make contact again with Manafort and therefore with all the uh, tyrants and torturers around the world. Okay. Now, on Wednesday, here, of course, the big issue is Ted Cruz, right? The number two, the runner-up. Most of those 721, and indeed as many as 1,200 of the delegates, almost half of the delegates, uh, were favorable to Cruz. And they had a gathering in, in front of a hangar at the airport, and somehow Trump contrived to fly over with his plain, and he was booed and hissed. There were curses, gesticulations, coarse uh, gestures, all these things going on. So we got to the point where Cruz had to give his uh, speech, right, just about before Pence, and Cruz says, I'm up here to fight for principles. As soon as he said principles, I said he's not going to endorse and by the time he got to the end, he said, you have to go and vote for people you trust. You have to vote for the Constitution, and you have to vote your conscience. Well, vote your conscience had been the issue of the previous week. So he was lustily booed, and the Pence rollout was ruined. Now, that is another split in the party. The entire evangelical faction alienated, estranged from Trump, or at least a lot of them. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So there we have it. Cruz refuses to endorse, and that means that, you know, an appreciable part, what's it going to be? 10, 20, 30 percent of the Christian evangelicals are not going to support Trump. And the remaining ones may be simply passive supporters who vote for Trump, perhaps, although this is incompatible. Uh, 
it's time for some religious authority to issue. I guess the Pope in Rome has already done it, but others should do it too, that voting for Trump is incompatible with the Christian faith, right? We've heard that Sharia law is incompatible. Okay, voting for Trump is equally and perhaps more incompatible, more incompatible in, uh, in my book. So <clears throat> we've seen uh, Cruz and his gesture, right? He was booed. His wife was threatened. This is an ugly crowd, right? Trump means mob rule. Trump means oclocracy, oclocracy, mob rule. So uh, we've seen all of that. Um, notice also that Trump uh, steps on his own convention by calling into O'Reilly because he's got some visceral uh, compulsive need for attention. Remember, Trump says that he suffers from a mild case of obsessive compulsive disorder. I regard this as a cover story, but uh, we'll get to that. Um, Trump's fakery. Well, he's got no protective tariff. He says wages are too high. His whole life is an anti-union <clears throat> Mein Kampf uh, concerning trade. He says, well, he He's not against free trade. He loves free trade. He says he's a great free trader. He just wants better deals. He wants great free trade sellouts. What are the criteria? He never says. Um, there's also this question. Was Trump close to a nervous breakdown any time this week? Because that's, I think, the thing we have to, uh, we have to look at. Uh, there was the fact that Trump and Melania went back to New York on Monday night. Trump had been scheduled to have a meeting with important fat cat contributors on Tuesday morning, and he stood them up, right? Maybe Sheldon Adelson uh, was rebuffed there. We don't know. Um, but he, he went away and he didn't come back until uh, Thursday evening when it was time to have the, uh, the, the uh, acceptance speech that Trump was going to give. However, Melania had been out of the public view from Monday night until Thursday night, essentially for 72 hours, right? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and there was some speculation, where is she? Right? And when she comes back, will she have black and blue marks on her face uh, or not? Uh, so she did show up, but uh, she scowled all the way through the proceedings on Monday night, as long as she was there. She scowled especially when Ivanka was uh, in the limelight. So that's all uh, highly interesting. Trump, profiteer off public troth. Uh, the Mata Lago uh, estate there in Palm Beach had been given, deeded in a will by Marjorie Merriweather Post to the U.S. federal government saying, that's a Southern White House for our president. Somehow Trump got it. How did that go down? He's an insider. He's got corrupt contacts. We know that he got a sweetheart deal on his bankruptcy in 90 to 91. At that point, Citibank, his banker, was under the control of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. They were in receivership. They had been seized Thanksgiving 1990. So he got a great deal. He's an insider. And then how did Trump ever get the post office here on Pennsylvania Avenue? It's a tower which dominates the Capitol. And on the other side, the Treasury and beyond that, the White House. This is terrible. Uh, this is just awful. Now, uh, let's see what else we should go through. We're going we're gonna to shift now to the, to the Democrats um, concerning the vice presidential pick by Hillary. Here's what we would say. Um, first of all, this guy Tim Kaine is too much of a right winger, and he's also too weak he uh, is on record. He somehow wants to further deregulate banks uh, and um, just generally way too far to the right. So Kane, we do not approve of. Um, and the, the dangerous thing we're seeing with this, this stuff about Hillary's choices, uh, I'm wondering, has she got some advisors in there left over from the Kathleen Kennedy Townsend debacle here in Maryland in the year 2002. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, uh, sort of a center-left Democrat, and of course with the Kennedy name, she was running for governor of Maryland here in 2002, 
And her advisor said, look, the key to your success is you got to win over white men. White men? You got to win over labor. You got to win over blacks, Hispanics, um, lower middle class voters. But white men in that sense? No. Anyway, poor Kathleen Kennedy Townsend put Admiral Larson on the ticket, an admiral, uh, and lost the election. And we had to then – we had to uh, – suffer the yoke of Paul Ehrlich, the, uh, what is he, a uh, cockroach exterminator, who was then governor for the next uh, four years. So now we're being told that Hillary is considering Admiral Stavridis. Admiral Stavridis is the former NATO commander who was, according to my analysis, driven out. He was forced out in 2012 to 2013 as part of this group of disgruntled, insubordinate, Petraeus-style uh, officers, and you can see, you go to my Twitter, there's a picture there of uh, Petraeus and Stavridis. Uh, he, of course, was the Navy. He's also an embezzler. He, right, he, got, uh, he took money from the budget to finance his uh, vacations or, you know, playboy activities around in Europe. Um, what I'm seeing is the Kathleen Kennedy Townsend syndrome. Forget about white men, Hillary. You've got to focus on the core groups that you know you can win. And then, you know, if anything, the Philadelphia suburban soccer moms, not white men. So this is very dangerous. So no to Stavridis, no to Tim Kaine. Who should you pick? Pick Elizabeth Warren. Why not? Pick Elizabeth Warren. Uh, this whole election, it's always one in the middle, right? The five to 10 percent of independents uh, who would be intrigued by Elizabeth Warren, right? She's got their number. She could do a good job among them. And uh, other source, other other possibilities, I think, are not so good. That guy Perez, uh, Perez would certainly be better than Stavridis or, or Kane. Uh, the Supreme Court has um, dealt a blow, has rejected part of the Republican theory of why voting rights should be denied. And therefore, uh, that will essentially facilitate some voting in the, uh, in the November election. So summing up on, on Trump, right? This is not Americanism. He says it's either globalism or Americanism. Well, you lose on both counts, Trump. And then these co stupid commentators talk about nationalism. Trump is not a nationalist. He's a nativist. He's a racist. He's a secessionist. How can you be a nationalist and a secessionist at the same time? Lincoln was a nationalist. Look what that looked like. Open to immigration, you know, socially progressive for the age. And that's, that would be the same, the same story today. And, and no secessionism and try to you know, limit the nativism. The nativism party, of course, was the know-nothings, and they collapsed. Not a nationalist. He is the party of national sabotage, of wrecking the United States, and, of course, of national bankruptcy, which he has called for. He says, I'm going to unilaterally cut down the debt. That means, obviously, national bankruptcy. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. World Crisis Radio. We're going to rush through here, getting to the end. A lot of stuff from the convention, but we have to think something about foreign policy. The Turkish coup. Well, uh, the Turkish coup didn't work. I would not uh, mock the efforts of those who did this. I think there were some, uh, some pretty decent people involved in that coup, although certainly not all. But this, uh, the guy who was the Interlik uh, commander, I think, ought to be taken seriously. This was not some kind of a uh, farce. It was real. Uh, you, can, you can go back to Stauffenberg and Kvirnheim and the German officers who tried to take care of Hitler in uh, August, July 20th, 1944. You could make fun of that, but that had a chance of succeeding, and I think this Turkish one might have too. Uh, I deplore the fact that uh, Obama came out and said, this is a coup, uh, whereas, of course, that triggers all kinds of uh, problems, right, with the U.S. laws. Remember that with Sisi, 
even though the U.S. policy was rotten and hostile in regard to Sisi, they did not call it a coup, so they would not trigger any of these uh, special uh, provisions. Now, we're going to be working. Tax Wall Street Party is going to be there in Cleveland, and uh, we're going to be at the Democratic National Committee. Hey, if you want to volunteer, you want to join us, I'm sorry, it's in Philadelphia, right? The Democratic National Committee in Philadelphia this week. We will have a squad there, I think, in particular on Tuesday and Wednesday. But send in your names. Right? Go to tarpley.net, write in through the contact box, uh, and we'll forward it. Or go to the uh, TWSP.us. also shows you a way to get in touch with us. So here's what we want. First, uh, Hillary Clinton should be ordered to channel her warmongering against ISIS and Nusra, not Assad and not anybody else. OK, like we can say she's an incurable warmonger. Well, put it to work against somebody who is uh, deserving. In other words, project your evil against something more evil than yourself. Uh, she should also, Hillary should issue a statement saying that her view of the Constitution, her con construction, she construes the Constitution as saying that a congressional declaration of war must precede any other countries coming under attack. We then want to seize the Fed. We want to have $6 trillion. That's $5 trillion to create 30 million new productive jobs in infrastructure and other parts of industry, one and a half trillion to refinance the entire student loan debt pool down to zero percent so we can freeze that problem and prevent it from growing while we're finding ways to get out of it otherwise. Tax Wall Street, one percent Wall Street sales tax on turnover, plus 15 percent protective tariff. We want that. We want her to fight Trump. We want the Democratic campaign to pay adequate attention to the fact that Trump is a fascist. He is a psychotic. By the way, we have a rape accusation against Trump from Jill Harth, H-A-R-T-H. This has been amply covered by the London Guardian, okay? Typical U.S. press, kowtowing for Trump, bootlicking for Trump, the establishment insider candidate. Trump is a fascist. He's psychotic. He's an accused rapist. He's corrupt. Uh, how about this? The Democratic National Committee should offer to pay the legal fees of the former Trump employees, associates, and other persons who have been forced to sign non-disclosure pledges about what they know about Trump. Remember when people were getting beat up in the Trump rallies and Trump said, I'll pay your legal fees? Hey, Democrats, fight! How about saying you'll pay the legal fees for anybody who gets involved in non-disclosure? Because, of course, and, uh, Tony Schwartz, the, I think, uh, prophetic crit critic of Trump, is telling us that the Trump lawyers have come after him, and they want all the royalties on that book, The Art of the Deal, to go come back to Trump. And that means 30 years, 29, 30 years after the uh, the fact uh, rumors around that Hillary was actually paid in cash by the Saudis to oust uh, Gaddafi. Well, we certainly better clear that up before she's nominated. And uh, of course, her other activities are well known. So and 15 percent protective tariff. Now, as much as we can, Manbij, the siege, siege is continuing. ISIS is losing house by house. Uh, ISIS has lost 50 percent in Iraq, 20 percent in Syria. McGurk at the Andrews Air Force Base World Summit. We had 40 countries out of the 67 in the anti-ISIS coalition were there at Andrews here near Washington. Uh, McGurk says the liberation of Mosul is in sight. Uh, Raqqa uh, a little bit later. But here's the idea. They're all saying right? the tide has turned. Mosul is going to fall. The goal of this entire thing, the theme of this meeting, was to escalate against ISIS and wipe out ISIS as soon as possible. The big saboteur is the new 
British Defense Minister Fallon. Fallon is going around saying, I won't cooperate with those bloody Russians. That's sabotage, buddy. Get this Fallon on a short leash, right? This is the wonderful envoy sent by Theresa May, the uh, Chinese agent who is now the head of the British government. Perfide Albion is back with a vengeance, with betrayal. And our stupid officials here don't know. So Fallon also says Raqqa is a remote event. In other words, it's going to take a long time to get to Raqqa. The hell with it. You've got to, you've got to make sure you take Raqqa in September before the end of the season, before the rain uh, starts. So Kerry says there's a general desire to escalate. Uh, Kerry's con press conference he wants to have a counter-terror coordination from Europe to the Philippines, all around the world. The uh, Iraq support group met uh, on the edge of this, U.S., Canada, Germany, Japan, Kuwait, and the Netherlands. German Foreign Minister Steinmeier says it's time to hit Mosul 10%, because they have every interest, right? The German government needs to end the Syrian civil war to stop the uh, uh, overwhelming uh, tidal wave of immigrants, which are in some ways unsustainable, to be sure. 10% uh, of Iraq is still under ISIS. Now, here's the other thing. The strategy of tension and the October surprise. This is the basis of the Trump campaign. In Nice, we found that we had multiple people involved. In Munich, the police are adamant that three shooters, don't forget this, Three shooters were involved, our listeners in Germany. What we've seen here again and again is at the beginning, it's two or three shooters, and then they disappear from the brainwashing narrative. So this is no good. In Germany, of course, we had the axe murderers, or axe-wielding attack, stabbing attack uh, some days ago, and now we have the Olympia Zentrum in northern Munich. So each of these you know, operates on many, many levels. And was ISIS does want to become an international uh, terror organization working for Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the highest bidder. But uh, there's whatever happens in this field, either it's done to some extent out of regard or with an eye on Trump, and uh, or either that or uh, or it's actually ordered up. So it's it, it may not be the main cause. Trump may not be the main cause, but he's certainly uh, a factor in this. So, Tax Wall Street Party will be at the Democratic National Convention. Contact us. Go to tarpley.net, Speakers Bureau. Use the contact box. I'll forward it to the proper people. You'll hear from us. And you've also got the... Uh, Tax Wall Street Party, TWSP.US. So take a look at the uh, reports I issued from on the, on the Republican convention. We'll be continuing that next week. And by the way, we don't want Michelle Flournoy as Secretary of Defense either. But time for that in the future. See you next week on World Crisis Radio. Nos de Vridis.